Hello, my name is Sara Peters and I'm a senior researcher at the National Food Institute, the Technical University of Denmark, and I'll be talking about burden of illness and burden of disease studies. And an overview of this talk, I will start by discussing why we want to estimate the burden of foodborne diseases. I will briefly describe burden of illness and burden of disease studies and discuss differences between these two. I will go a bit more into detail uh, on burden of disease studies and talk about basic principles and methodologies and we'll finish with some conclusions and suggestions for further reading. So coming back to our crucial One Health questions uh, that we need to answer to prioritize our interventions to improve food safety. We have to start by um, estimating what's the impact, the public health impact of different foodborne diseases so we can compare these diseases according to their importance. We then want to know wh what is actually causing this burden, which foods are more important and contributing for disease in the population. Afterwards, what are our options for interventions to reduce the burden and we then want to uh, measure the effect of these different interventions. So I will be focusing on the first question. So how do we estimate the public health impact of different foodborne diseases? How do we answer this question? The obvious or immediate answer would be to actually look into the number of annual cases of gastroenteritis reported in the country. So if we talk about food pathogens, foodborne pathogens, we would look into the number of episodes caused by each of these pathogens. And this means that we would be using incidence as an indicator for importance of disease. In Denmark, for example, it would be very simple. We can actually access this, this data in the public health the website of the Public Health Institute uh, where they publish surveillance data annually. But we acknowledge, we know now that these surveillance data or, or the number of cases that are captured by surveillance only represent the very tip of the iceberg when, when the, the true burden or the true dimension of the problem is actually much larger and unknown. And why does this happen? If we look into surveillance as, as a pyramid, we then know that the number of cases reported are only the, the top of this pyramid, whereas the true number of cases are in the bottom. And why does this happen? Well, first of all, because not all people that get ill actually go to the doctor. From the ones that go to the doctor, not all get a sample taken. Even all this, not all the samples that are taken are analyzed or tested for the pathogens at the laboratory. There's issues with test sensitivity for, for different pathogens, different laboratory tests. And also not all lab confirmed cases are reported to our surveillance. So this means that we have a, potentially a substantial gap between reported number of cases and true number of cases. So to estimate these true burden, we use burden of illness studies. They allow us to estimate the true number of cases and deaths caused by each pathogen in the population. And we do this by uh, estimating multipliers using these this, uh, steps in the pyramid, the surveillance pyramid, to estimate the multipliers that account for underreporting and, and underdiagnosis. And I will not go into detail in these studies on the online course. We will talk more about these methods on campus. But burden of illness studies are, are very useful to inform uh, policy making in food safety and risk managers because they do allow us to estimate how many cases occur in the population caused by each pathogen. We're also able to assess trends if, if a pathogen is increasing or decreasing in the population. And we can also estimate health costs. There are several examples of, of burden of illness studies conducted worldwide. A, a famous and, and large one was performed in the United States uh, at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and their results are published in their website. They looked into 31 foodborne pathogens. But just to give an example of, of the type of results that we obtained, looking into different pathogens, salmonella, you can see that there were only less than 42,000 cases reported in a given year in a country. And this is actually only sentinel cases, so not representing all uh, sentinel states, not all states. But this was ex extrapolated for the whole country and for the true burden of illness. And then the final number estimated was around 1 million. So there's actually a, a substantial underreporting and underdiagnosis factor. 
If we look into listeria, for instance, which is a less frequent pathogen or disease, but also much more severe, there was only around 800 cases reported, and the burden of illness estimated was only twice, twice as much, so uh, much l lower under reporting and, di and their diagnosis here. Other examples of burden of illness studies were published in Canada, in France, and, and in Japan, and there are, there are other examples. So with burden of illness studies, we can estimate the true number of cases caused by each pathogen, but actually they still leave us with some questions unknown. And, and you've seen this, this topic before. What is more important? How can we compare diseases? For instance, what is more important that 10,000 cases of mild and short duration uh, gastroenteritis episodes due to pathogen A, or 20 cases of a very severe illness or potentially with long-lasting sequela that can also be life-threatening? How can we compare the impact of these, these different diseases? Just putting some numbers and to, to, um, to understand this problem, here we have uh, different numbers of cases and, and uh, other uh, sequela caused by different foodborne pathogens, where you can see immediately that norovirus is actually the one causing more cases of disease in the population. So this could be an indication that's the more important one. But if we look at rotavirus, for instance, there's actually more people going to the doctor due to a rotavirus infection, then this could be seen as a proxy for severity of the diseases. There's even more visits to the hospital, which is a higher indication of severity. And then if we look at salmonella, is the one actually causing the higher number of deaths, which is, of course, the most serious outcome of, of a disease. And it also causes a higher number of reactive arthritis, which is a lifelong uh, sequela that decreases quality of life substantially. And if you look at Campylobacter, it's actually the only pathogen listed here causing Guillain-Barré syndrome, also a very severe complication of foodborne disease. And then we go back to norovirus, and it's the high, it has the higher number of irritable bowel syndrome. How, so how do we make sense of these numbers, and how can we rank these diseases according to their importance? This is where we use burden of disease studies, where the principle is to compare the burden of different foodborne diseases in a comparable way. So we can actually use this measure to compare between different diseases and risk factors. Burden of disease studies, they do take into account incidence and mortality, but also the severity of the disease, the duration of its symptoms, and also the whole and complete list of potential adverse health effects. Because they do take into account incidence and mortality, they build on burden of illness studies. So again, we want to use the true number of cases and not only the reported number of cases, what's captured by surveillance. And the most commonly used measure um, for burden of disease studies is disability adjusted life years or DALIs. And what are DALIs? It is actually a, a simple concept. They translate the number of years life uh, of life lost due to uh, all health outcomes of a disease, either by the loss of quality of life or by premature death. So if we see this concept in a visualization, we can see here, let's imagine an individual that is it's, born in a perfect state of quality of life and lives um, like this for 20 years when something happens and it's a disease or, or a, a, an injury which leads to a substantial reduction of the quality of life, in this case 40%. And the individual lives like this for the next 40 years when we have a premature death. And so compared to the life expectancy, we have 20 years of life lost to do, uh, due to premature death. If we sum this to the calculated number of years life of life lost due to decreased quality of life, then we can estimate DALIs. And of course, I'm giving this hypothetical example at the individual level, but when thinking about burden of disease studies, we're interested at the population level. Some important concepts in burden of disease studies, a health outcome is any potential uh, adverse health consequence due to a disease. And this can be acute symptoms or also chronic symptoms or, or sequela. And these ability weights are weights that describe the, the severity of a specific disease. 
So these factors range from zero to one, and they are estimated based on judgments um, on, uh, about the, the, the weight given to the loss of quality of life. Um, an example, for instance, the disability weight for a mild diarrhea would be much lower than a severe or blood diarrhea. And these concepts, concepts we can put together in an outcome tree where we can see exposure or infection with a specific pathogen and then we can list the, um, all potential adverse uh, consequences of the disease. We're then going to combine this with specific disability weights and duration data for these outcomes. And then we estimate DALIs for each of them and sum them uh, to estimate DALIs for that disease. And then, of course, the symptoms and sequela can be multiple for a specific disease. And how do we understand DALIs or what impact, uh, which factors have a higher impact in a, in a high or low number of DALIs? Where we have a, li uh, a higher burden of disease or number of DALIs if a disease, is, disease causes a high number of deaths, especially if these deaths are in a, in a young fraction of the population. Also, if it has a high disability weight, meaning if it uh, uh, has a high severity, if it has a high incidence, of course, if there's many cases, and if it has a long list of sequelae or with long duration. And what do we use this information for? Because these DALIs are a comparable measure, then we are able to rank, for instance, foodborne diseases. We can compare different foodborne pathogens and even chemical diseases caused by chemicals or even other risk factors. We can also compare foodborne diseases with other non-foodborne diseases. And there are some examples of burden of disease studies conducted at national level. Probably the, the most famous and largest one uh, is from the Netherlands, where they publish results uh, regularly. And here we have the results for 2009, where we can see that it was estimated that in the Dutch population, Toxoplasma gondii is actually the foodborne pathogen causing a highest burden, fo followed by Campylobacter and rotavirus. There's also a large uh, initiative to estimate the global burden of foodborne diseases, and this is organized by the World Health Organization. And this initiative is um, focusing not only on enteric pathogens, but also on parasites and chemicals, with the aim of estimating global and regional uh, burden of disease estimates for, for, different, uh, for all these set of pathogens. And results are expected to be published relatively soon, probably next year. So just to conclude, uh, burden of illness studies, they do is, uh, allow us to estimate the true number of cases and deaths caused by a, different, uh, a specific pathogen in a population, and they are useful to inform risk management decisions. They tell us how many cases occur, we can also assess trends and estimate costs. Burden of disease studies, however, they go a step forward and they allow us to compare different foodborne diseases by taking into account severity and duration of disease as well, as, as well as all uh, the range of po potential health outcomes of a specific disease. And they build on burden of illness estimates. And if we go back to our uh, crucial One Health questions, we focused now on the first one. How do we estimate the impact of different foodborne diseases? And to answer the different, the following questions, uh, we will then, we can go back to our integrated food safety approach and we will go to a second step in this framework, which is for source attribution studies. And this is what you'll hear about next. And just some suggestions for further reading. There's some scientific publications that you can, uh, uh, where you can read more about burden of illness and burden of disease studies.